Give the gift of thoughtful conversation this holiday season with a membership to the Commonwealth Club. Hello, I'm Ann W. Smith, speaking for the Commonwealth Club as co-chair of the Member-Led Arts Forum, and I'm pleased to welcome Commonwealth Club members and everyone else to our program today. Normally, we would be doing this in person at our beautiful building on the Embarcadero, but we are doing it today like we've done many things this year virtually. The Arts Forum holds special program relating to the arts in the Bay Area and beyond throughout the year. We're delighted to present this special program, Refilling Seats. Yes, Refilling Seats, in partnership with Theater Bay Area, where I happen to also be the proud president of the Board of Directors. I'm going to... Uh, turn you over to our executive director, Brad Erickson, who will introduce the panel. And uh, we'll look forward to a wonderful hour of conversation about refilling seats. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. It's really delightful to be here. And, and as we were getting ready for the show just a few minutes ago, it's been a little bit of old home week as, as these folks have come together. Um, we've had very few opportunities to meet in person over the last 20 months. And so even just seeing each other on Zoom is a real delight. Let me introduce them to you and then we'll dive into some conversation. Um, these are four newish artistic directors. They came on um, either relatively right before the COVID pandemic, during the COVID pandemic, um, or even as it had seemed that we were moving out of it and here we are today. And so their experiences, not only as new leaders in their organizations, but new leaders at this particular time, I think is going to provide for a really interesting conversation today. So with us, we have um, Tim Bond, who is the artistic director at TheaterWorks. Joanna Feltzer, the Artistic Director at Berkeley Repertory Theater, Sean San Jose at the Magic Theater, and Kalia Davis at the Bay Area, Bay Area Children's Theater. And I'm delighted to have them here. I'm also happy to say they're all members of Theater Bay Area. So delighted to have you all here. Um, I did note at the, be at the beginning, when I, I went back to your websites to kind of see when I could figure out when you came on, it's all been something of a blur. And Joanna, I think you were the first and came on in the fall of 2019 when we had no idea that any of this was going to be in front of us. And, and maybe talk about what that was like, revving up into your first full season at Berkeley Rep, only to have you know the brakes hit a little bit into the season. First of all, can I just say, I love being in a group where like, I'm the old timer. That's um, amazing and ridiculous. Yeah, I started at Berkeley Rep in September of 2019. I had um, what in retrospect seems like an incredibly blissful five months, <laughs> five and a half months with all of the challenges attendant in taking over an organization, you know, um, my predecessor, Tony Taconi, had led Berkeley Rep as artistic director for 22 years and as the associate artistic director for eight years before that. So I thought the challenges ahead of me were simply um, coming into a new company, learning what it wanted and needed of me, what my agenda was going to be for it. You know, all of those things that at the time seemed um, plenty challenging, only to find that really within a few months, because when I think back, um, it was really in February, I think, that we mm -hmm. all started to get a sense of this impending mm -hmm. potential threat. So we started having conversations about health protocols and hand washing. And, you know, we weren't even in the land of things like masking yet. And I'd never heard of Zoom, I can just say. Um, <laughs> you know, and by the middle of March, we, like everybody, had fully shut down. Um, and so... Well, maybe I'll leave it at that. But that, yeah. that was the context of my first year on the job. Yeah. Um, so I've now been um, in a leadership position at Berkeley Rep for, I don't know, three times as long in COVID times as I have in normal times. I'm incredibly 
incredibly relieved and proud to say that we started performances, live performances in our actual theater a few weeks ago. And to be in a place, first of all, I know, thank you, my friends and colleagues for your <laughs> yeah. waving. Um, no, yeah. This one totally felt like we're all... Um, we're all really in this together as a community. And it feels like for me to go through the experimentation of opening up our doors and figuring out what those protocols are and how our audiences are responding. Um, the beautiful part of this time is that I feel like we've all been in conversation in a way that mm. I think is really, really unprecedented. So as thrilled as the four of us, you know, Tim and Sean and Kalia and I were to see each other today, it's in part because over the last 20 months, we have been in conversation together, first mm. precipitated, I think, by total crisis, and then by the opportunity of what it was as a community to think how we were all gonna walk through this together. And I say that in relationship both to the COVID pandemic, but also to this real call for change in terms of anti-racism and in rethinking what our relationships were to social justice. And it's meant that there have been incredibly rich and rigorous conversations that have happened among arts leaders. Um, so I, I have colleagues now in, in these three people with whom I get to spend time today, but also across the Bay Area in ways that I never had anticipated. So sorry, yeah. I feel like I just spat out a whole lot of thoughts and feelings about it all. But, um, but that's sort of where I find myself today. Yeah, yeah. Tim, you came in like in March, I think of 2020, right? So you were on your way, obviously, you, you were ready to take those reins. And I, w w was there a show up and running when you came on? And did you have to close it down? Or was it already where where were you in that timeline? And you're muted. I started, um, you think I know how to use Zoom by now. Um, uh, I, I started uh, officially full time in March, but it was going to be remote from the beginning anyway, because I was still finishing my time in, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, and then COVID re reared its head and I uh, decided to just move here uh, in April. Uh, because the, all my other shows, I had four other shows going on uh, throughout the nation, the Guthrie, the Kennedy Center, all these places. And they all, of course, within a couple of weeks shut down. So I just decided, well, I'm just going to move now and get there. And um, we were running at Theater Works at that time, a production called uh, They Promised Her the Moon, um, mm. which was a world premiere. It opened um, and uh, closed, uh, cl opened on a Saturday and closed on a Wednesday uh, the next week. So um, then the uh, Robert Kelly, our 50 year founder, was still uh, officially in charge through the rest of that season, which ended mm. in June. So they made the decision to to stream that show. So they were able they were able to capture it um, mm. and, uh, you know, archivally and then run that video. So our subscribers and audience members who had bought tickets were able to see it. Um, and that sort of started the whole pandemic. And then Kelly and I worked together to figure out all of the different uh, virtual productions we've done since then, which was 28. Um, 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 through last year. I mean, a number of them are readings and some of them were yeah. films, films that we made. Others were shorts. I mean, we've learned a lot <laughs> and done a lot of things. Um, yeah. And how did your audiences respond to, to that? I mean, were you, were they engaging? And I've, I've heard, you know, we've, we've talked in our meetings together that you're, you're also getting audiences all over the country because you don't have to necessarily be in Palo Alto or Mountain View to see it. That's true. And, you know, so initially our initial audience was very happy to have the stream of that show. And then as we started to do other productions, you know, there were good viewings. But as time has gone on, I think people are having fatigue of 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 looking at this in terms of our our traditional theater going audience at our theater. Mm -hmm. I, I see other heads nodding. So that might be true for others. But we have found other audience members uh, throughout different states, actually internationally, um, who have have tuned in and seen it, but not in numbers that are are significant enough to make it um, 
fill the gap in 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 us feeling we're having truly the reach that we want to have. But it has been heartening to know we've had people from the Philippines and from Germany and from wherever, you know, tuning in to see our, our productions. Um, and when we did um, Pride and Prejudice, um, which ironically had just been filmed by uh, uh, the playwright, uh, Paul, Paul Gordon and composer for that piece, which we did in December of 2019, Mm. They had done a major uh, five camera shoot of it, uh, uh, kind of a, a national theater level uh, video of it, which we can't <laughs> afford uh, since then. And it would just so happen to be made that went out and was seen by like hundreds of thousands of people and is wow. now is now uh you know, able to be gotten on Amazon Prime. So that's an unusual and really incredibly far reaching project that had sort of planned to do that, to be able to replicate that again and again for us uh, going into our current season is beyond our means um, right now. But we are streaming. We are we have streamed uh, our first show. We opened our first production uh, last month in October. Well, two months ago now in October with Lizard Boy. Um, and we had quite a few viewings of that, and that was very good. But again, not enough to make up our total audience size. And we're uh, getting ready to have our first preview tonight of uh, It's a Wonderful Life, which we will also be streaming in about two weeks. And mm -hmm. we're hoping we get good viewage of that. Yeah, great. So, Kalia and Sean, you came onto your jobs during the shutdown. Kalia, I think you were first, and then Sean. Um, so, I, I know you'd been, you know, working at the Bay Area Children's Theater for a while, Kalia, but still, to come on, take the reins, and tell, I mean, what was that like? And I know that there was programming that you all were doing during that time, so maybe talk about that experience. Sure thing. So my um, trajectory into the position that I now hold as artistic director at Bay Area Children's Theater is a little um, special because right before Nina Meehan, the CEO and founder of the company, offered me this position, she actually came to me back in end of April, May, like basically like start of May um, with a book called A Kid's Book About Racism by Jelani Memory and was so excited about this. And she said, I feel like this book needs to be adapted and you need to be the one to adapt it. And I want you to direct it. And I don't want any of the producing entities in our industry to bother you, <laughs> which is very rare. So I was already so excited about the fact that even after I knew they had shut their doors, they were still thinking of innovative ways to create theatrical programming for young audiences that also, Joanna started to talk a little bit about this, bring to light the need for more specific intentional social justice and anti-racism media and programming, especially for our young people. Uh, so I was already very excited about that type of work that they wanted to do and that they wanted to bring me into it. So I put a lot of my heart and soul into making it happen. We put that show up real quick. I called it a kid's play about racism. And we were one of the first to utilize the now very famous method of taking theatrical storytelling and putting it into a film medium. Um, and we also were one of the first young uh, audience programs that Broadway On Demand featured. And Traylon, who works for Broadway On Demand, actually was so excited about the numbers that we received. Tim was speaking to streaming. We actually streamed very well that we were extended. And then that produced the new uh, wave of young audience programming that they now have in educational programming. They actually have sections on Broadway On Demand for that reason. And so we're really happy to see that even though this shutdown caused a lot of pain and harm and hurt, it also opened up further opportunities for expansion in the ways in which young audiences are able to receive the type of work that we were producing ahead of time. And also think about how are they consuming this now? Um, we are also an organization that really likes to test our boundaries and take risks. And so when I jumped in, they were already talking about um, 
an at-home theater experience called Play On. And Play On is our at-home theater kit. We have, it's a screen-free audio musical adventure that comes in the mail. And in the box that you receive, you have different items that can help in the storytelling experience. They're items that just enhance the experience for a kid. It's not necessarily needed, uh, but it's fun. Kids love to have things in their hands. Uh, And then they're listening to the adventure and the kids are a part of the adventure. And that is actually the genesis of, and the catalyst to what we're excited about launching into in the new year is having more official interactive and immersive experiences for young people live because we recognized how fun it was to have them be at the center of our work through the Play On series. That's really interesting though. And I, you know, I think that's part of the conversation too is the way that having to do things differently and having to do video and film and whatnot and just reach audiences in different ways, maybe how will that linger on? And maybe, you know, some Joanna and Tim, you're saying that you're ready to kind of just get the audiences back and and go and go on with a, you know, live show on stage. But we have learned these other ways and the streaming that's happening and ways to continue to reach audiences. Um, and I, it's interesting to see kind of the ongoing learning and changes that will happen because of the pandemic and the ways that we were forced to do things differently. Yeah, Joanna. Yeah, actually, I don't think I'm saying that we're 100 percent reverting just mm, to okay. in-person programming. Um, you know, I think the commitment we made early on in this was that everything was going to be an experiment. Mm-hmm. Everything was going to be things we were trying for the first time. And and the reason to invest in those experiments was so that at the end of this, whenever the end may be, um, we would come out of it with new skills, with some new practices, with some different modes and means mm-hmm. of engaging with audiences, whether they're our subscription audience or whether, you know, as Tim and Kelly have said, we have had this incredible um, opportunity to be essentially in conversation with people who are in Paris and in London and in Montana. And, you know, some of them were people who had relationships to Berkeley Rep mm-hmm. in pre-pandemic or, you know, maybe even decades before. And this was a chance for them to reconnect to an organization that, you know, had been really meaningful to them, as well as new people who were responding perhaps to a particular piece of programming. So I, I think, and forgive me, I'm now going to speak for all of us. Interrupt me when I'm wrong, friends. But I think all of us are figuring out how we're gonna take the things that we've learned positive and negative and use them as we move forward. I don't think anybody is like, oh, business as usual, we're going back to the before in any form. Yeah, yeah. Sean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump over to you because um, you've, you've taken the lead at this legendary Bay Area theater company and you are making some changes there on its cusp of reopening. Maybe talk to us a little bit about about that and your vision and and some of the changes already underway. Yeah, thanks, Brad. And thank you for uh, gathering us together. Thank you, Miss Ann, for doing this. I miss the gavel is the only thing. (laughs) It's good to uh, see a lot of old friends and some new friends. And and yeah, I mean, I'm excited to hear what what, what you all are talking about. And and for me, I think a lot of it was um, I mean, I, I come from a group that, that's been here in San Francisco that is kind of specialized in just uh, reaching community. And so there was kind of a very particular focus always has been at the, the, the luxury of, get, of what we get to do and the passion of what we get to do. And now having this new opportunity, as you say, Brad, a, a, a bigger platform at Magic Theater It's been helpful for me in a weird way to come into it where our our land beneath us is is unsettled because I'm hoping that we can use this time to to reshape the landscape. I mean, we long overdue for it. Class-wise, race-wise, culture-wise, language-wise, phenotype-wise, every-wise there is. And especially in the Bay Area where, you know, our, our cities are getting swooped us under us from, by these unknown mega corporations, you know, and, 
every block you go down gets changed before you. So how do we hold on to what we have, which is power of communing, power of storytelling, power of seeding conversations that can make, you know, uh, if it doesn't make political change, at least it, uh, it plants dialogue for, for civic thought, at least. I say all that sort of highfalutin stuff to say that coming into this, it's been helpful to, to be able to wipe away and go, what do we want to focus in on and how do we want to approach it? Because my whole approach to even uh, having the honor of being at a theater like this, but also accepting something to work in a, 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 a white organization, a white institution, when I'm interested in rightfully centering people of color throughout everything, it helps to have a, a, a wider open focus, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. that it doesn't feel like a total dismantling. And as we know, race stuff, class stuff, it's, it's all fear-based. So as soon as you start to make one move forward, everyone's like, why do you want to break that? And it's like, I don't want to break anything. I want to redefine things so they have resonance for more people. And so in that way, I think coming into a new position and saying, hey, we want to do a whole bunch of new things here has been a uh, it's been exciting. Now that sounds weird to say exciting mm -hmm. in a time that has been full of madness. And, you know, as Felzer alluded to, too, I think the biggest mistake for any of us moving forward is not even the form that we're going to use, but for us not to look at the near racial reckoning as, as some grave informer of where we go with the work that we do would be, you know, that would be just the, the biggest continuation, perpetuation of the madness that we've been living through. So if we don't take that and go, what are we going to do with it? And how do we implement it into the daily activity of our community? Because that's what we're doing. We commune. So let's, for us to sort of use that as an old newspaper is really would be the, the, the biggest error we can make. But what we can do is to look at it and look around it and, and start to build something, some new things together. Uh, you know, it's hard to say new things, though, with people. And it's hard to say race things because it, 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 it's always received as a sort of divider or some divisive thing. It's not that at all. It's looking at the reality of it and saying, well, now that we've recognized these things, why don't we build on it? Why don't we expand on it? Why don't we grow from it? All of us that came into the theater performance making practice learned from all our predecessors and all our ancestors, all of our mentors and teachers, and we expanded on that. We didn't replicate that. That doesn't do anything for the live performance form is live. It's about today. So I just, th this whole time has been like this extended pressure cooker of, of, of a great informing period. And it's so weird to think that we're at the end of 2021 when we kept thinking like, man, if we make it through 2020, we're going to be cool. And then all of a sudden I just looked up and I was like, what? We're about to end 2021 and we're still in this madness. So I think, you know, I think there's a lot. And though I say all that stuff and talk extra longer than anybody else, I do feel so hopeful moving forward with it because I think we're, uh, we're in, in, you know, empathetic industry. We're about communing. We're about gathering. And I think we can learn a lot and grow a lot from it all. Yeah. Um, well, some of what you're just saying now, Sean, is making me think about what, like, how are our how are people actually responding to being back in the theater, to seeing what you've got on stage? You, you created these seasons and uh, what, what's been the, I mean, for those of you, I think Tim and Joanna, you're the only ones who've actually had live audiences. Your house. Sean, you've had, you've had audiences and you have two Clea. All right. Well then everybody, what's it been like? I mean, what, how are they, how are they responding? 
I'm going to jump in because I would love to share as the person in charge of an organization that provided in-person programming and what that experience was like. But then I also got to go and witness Wintertime at Berkeley Rep, which is playing right now. It actually was my very first live show back since I had moved from New York City. I had been living in New York City for the last three and a half years. So uh, Six, the Broadway musical, was my last show I saw before the pandemic. I saw it in previews. Anyway, uh, Bay Area Children's Theater this past summer, because we like to do things a little kooky and crazy, we uh, did Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus uh, by Mo Willems and Deborah Wicks LaPuma. It's a musical, and we actually did it on a bus, uh, aka a sprinter van. They're amazing. And we did it outside. And so uh, Sean probably saw us because we were in Fort Mason for a lot of that time. We also were able to utilize Cal Shakes. They were very generous. And then we were on a cute little farm in San Ramon. But the whole thing was that we were outside and families were able to experience the joy of theater again in a safe environment. And it was just really heartwarming to see how easy it was for them to fall back into what it meant to share that experience as a family together. And the fact that even though our actors were masked as well, we had puppets, it was um, record, it was pre-recorded the whole show. So there's a lot of big gestures, but they themselves were not actually physically talking to the kids. There still was this sense of magic and wonder and joy that I saw in all the faces or all the little eyes. It was very sweet. And then on the flip side, being able to be in space with other people and get to share the experience of just seeing live performance. And Berkeley Rep is so smart in bringing a show to us during a time period that is winter time. And also though a show that was very bizarre and like we needed just a little bit of whimsy, um, a little bit of zany, and also just something very solid to hold on to story-wise. But it was just very fun. Um, if you haven't seen Winter Time, I'm gonna plug it. It's a wild ride. Uh, stay to the end. <laughs> so, but it just was a really beautiful experience for me as an audience member. So, uh, that felt good to be like, oh yeah, this is what it's like to share this time with other people who are complete strangers, but now we have something in common that we we got to experience together. It was really nice. Yeah. Have you all met Kalia, my new PR person? <laughs> <laughs> right, like, and hold up, because I'll be at your theaters too, okay, Tim? I'm gonna come see, I'm gonna come support, I'm gonna come to the magic. Like, now, I, what's so lovely is we are, we're kind of rolling. I'm a, I'm going to go to San Francisco Playhouse next week. I'm going to go to Berkeley Playhouse. It's nice that these seasons are coming out, not all at the same time. So I can choose to go to these theaters in a timely way that makes me feel good and comfortable and uh, get me, me revved back up to being an audience member. And a lot of theaters in the Bay Area, I think, are rallying together. That's something very special about us as Bay Area theaters is that we do talk to each other. Um, and we're aware of what we're doing. And I really appreciate how um, the seasons are being like, I don't know the word for it, but rolled out, dispelled. I don't know. It's fun. Yeah, Tim. Well, we um, we had a great time with Lizard Boy. It was, it was like a rock concert um, and people were really enjoying being out again. And 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 connected and um uh like the cheering before the show even began and the just the feeling of of community that happened around that show was really great mm -hmm. our houses were small but they were mighty and uh and it was and for the artists th to just have the opportunity to express again and to get reaction directly back you know which you don't get on zoom you know you put things out and it, it kind of goes into into thin air and and there was something really powerful about that experience and we had people coming also which was very interesting traveling who had been following this show um, for five years when it was done. We had people from all over the country coming in to see the production, um, which was really fascinating. And this one, this one woman in particular, I remember, she was in her early 20s and she had been listening to the score since she was a teenager. And, and, and she came all the way from Montana. They had driven all night, got there and saw the show. 
And she was like in tears afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. I've been wanting to see something wow. and to be around some people and to have theater again. And, and it was so meaningful. And, and uh, also, you know, many of our subscribers who did come, who were just saying, it's just been, it's, it's been terrible to be stuck at home and to not be back with their theater family again. So that was, it was really special. Um, it was also really challenging. Uh, we're the first, you know, I think we're the first uh, large theater to have an indoor production in uh, in in Northern California and most uh, hardly on the entire West Coast. There have been very few when we first started. So, um, you know, we had studied the protocols that had been done in other places and and the protocols went well. And, and for the most part, people were very uh, compliant with masks, with uh, showing tests to showing their vaccination cards and all those sorts of things. And it's been uh, that's been really good. But the challenge for us is we need more volunteers to help us in doing those tasks. Um, uh, and now during the holidays, it's very hard to get people to uh, to be there for all the performances because it takes like a front of house staff that's three times the size of normal to accomplish it. Um, so we're 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 challenged that way. But um, but most of all, it's just been great to be back out there again. Yeah. Yeah. Joanna. Yeah. We found it. Um, absolutely. Tim, as you say, not without its challenges, but really joyful to have people back in the building. Um, and I think they feel safe in coming there. People want to know that there are protocols in place to keep them safe. And I think they feel really good as they come into our space to know that everybody is gonna be masked in the audience, to know that everybody is vaccinated. For our first show for winter time, we've also capped um, our capacity at 60% so that people who mm. want to spread out a little bit and have a little social distancing can, you know, I think it's part of all of us learning how to be back in space together. It's been a really long time, you know, since we've been in, in shared space. So that was something, you know, for this first show, we wanted people to have a little bit of an on-ramp back to, you know, the intensity of sharing space together. But, um, but people are thanking us, frankly, for being there, for doing the work to make it safe and for giving them back their theater. Yeah. Sean, I think you guys even had a, a live in-person fundraiser back in the fall. Am I right with that? Uh, when we did the fundraiser, we actually did a, we did it outdoor. It was right before the, <clears throat> excuse me, right before the variant. But we did a, a our first event was um, one of our new programs, a new performance program where the San Francisco Poet Laureate, the great Tongo Ice and Martin uh, did a concert. And it was really great to do. Like everyone's saying, everyone wants to be back. Everyone wants to be together. And, and uh, thankfully, we live in one of the sane areas, you know, and so no one's tripping off of like false narratives around vaccines and stuff. And so to, to Felzer's point, like people want people want to be safe and they want to know that you're going to help make them safe. One of the, the big, the most instructive things about this, although, has also been you you have to wipe away it in a greater way any presumption of like yeah they're gonna come like yeah we're gonna get, we got a show we'll do the show and the show will be good and it's a dope show so people are gonna come which you kind of always think anyway but that doesn't equate to anything until you know people are actually in your space and you're sitting with them and so I think anything that that we're learning from it can be one of the lessons I, I've. I've taken is you really have to take care and who who you who you're inviting, how you're inviting them, why mm. you're inviting them, listening to people, listening, listening, not like it's a play. Come to the play. You subscribed. Come. You're going to come. You really. I mean, we, we again, we have to clear the decks for a minute to sort of go like, do you want to come back? Do you really love us? Do, are you worried? Are you into it? What you know, and to what Kalia saying. Themes may matter more, you know what I mean? Vibe may matter more. So all of that is, is I think, can be instructive for us and just create better dialogue with the communities that we, we want to work with. Um, but that, that, you know, there's no doubt people are going to come back to things. So I feel really hopeful about that. But I think, again, like 
uh, something that we can walk away with is 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 having a better relationship with who we're talking to and why we're talking to them and therefore what you're presenting. Mm-hmm. Um, to tag on to that, I also want to uplift and amplify accessibility that is inherently um, becoming part of the forefront of a lot of the way in which we're setting up our programming that unfortunately has not been at the forefront of a lot of theatrical institutions in the way that it should be. And it's because we've needed to, but just in thinking about the fact that, Sean, yeah, what especially in children's theater, we do this thing called a wraparound. So we provide information ahead of the time so that students and young people and their families know more about the work that they're going to be walking into and then try and provide something at the end so that they can take that home with them. They can think more about it. They can continue to live within the world based on what they had just seen. And I think that it's naturally starting to happen more and more that we are being very aware of what our audiences truly need in order for them to feel so comfortable coming back to our spaces and we're we are listening to them we've done so many more surveys than we've ever done before Mm. we've wanted to hear directly from our community what do you need it's something that we ask our staff every time we have a staff meeting what are your access needs how can we show up for you and i think it's really lovely to witness firsthand other theatrical institutions in the bay area who are really doing that work with their audiences now too. What do you actually need from us in order for you to feel so excited about coming back into our spaces? And it's something that I hope we hold on to as we move forward and hopefully work through this second wave of the pandemic, that we don't lose this inclusion and this accessibility opportunity where we're mm-hmm. actually like trying to create a, um, yeah, a more accessible environment for everyone. Let me ask um, maybe just a specific question about the accessibility, but also the safety in your theater in particular, Kalia. I mean, for the audience to know, um, most of our member theater companies and many, many of the performing arts groups around the Bay Area are using this basic protocol of needing to show a vaccine card when you arrive with your ID and everyone has to wear a mask when you're seated inside the theater. Some folks are having um concessions and others are not but but the in the theater experience is pretty much that but with dealing with with young audiences and with children what do you have a what is your what are your protocols um at Barry Children's Theater we have done very well at like avoiding because we have not had anything inside we've been like okay oh, we're just not gonna we're just not even gonna touch that but now we are um we have a holiday event coming up that will be outdoors at cal shakes so we will be probably implementing a lot of the same protocols that we did for our pigeon performances because audiences seem to work really well with that that included temperature checks everybody being masked and socially distanced um we have on staff someone who is a COVID officer, and so they're constantly giving us the updates. But I'm glad that you're lifting this up because it is a bit of a challenge working with my incredible colleagues and seeing how in my opinion, easy it is to just say, this is the way that it needs to be, and then assume that uh, audiences will adhere to it, when we can't actually demand that because our key demographic are three-year-olds to 10-year-olds. And Mm -hmm. just recently, they approved vaccines for five and up. So even if we say you must show proof of vaccine if you are five and up, we are discrediting the siblings of those five years, five year olds from being able to show up, too. So we are working right now with our COVID officer, watching and listening to all of the guidelines, checking in with our fellow colleagues in the TYA industry around the country and noting what they're doing for their indoor protocols um, and hopefully we'll be adhering to that and it's going to be something that is manageable by all parties. Uh, Something we noticed that we may need to invest in is on-site rapid testing, which is what they did with Winnie the Pooh in New York. Most recently, Mm. they had on-site rapid testing, so the moment the audience came in, they got a rapid test. It took about 15 minutes and then they were able to be seated. So it's something that we're really looking into and we're creating a budget around it because we we want everybody to feel safe, but we also don't want anyone to feel excluded. Right, right. Um, 
I think maybe something that would be interesting for the audience to know is the way that these protocols play out in the rehearsal room. And, you know, you've got a, you've got a musical coming up, Joanna, and you had a musical, Tim. I mean, how does that work if you're trying to wear masks and sing at the set? Maybe just tell us a little bit some of the stories from that experience of like just trying to rehearse a show and get it up on its feet in COVID era. Yeah. Um, the very first thing, actually, the first room that we gathered artists in was a workshop um, of our musical Goddess, which is coming up later in the season. And so that was a piece that was really de- the workshop process was meant to be obviously tons of singing, but also movement based. Um, And this was now a few months ago. So everybody was vaccinated, tested. We were testing. uh, We started off testing the whole company twice a week and we moved to three times a week. Um, And they were masked fully for the first mm, three weeks of a four week workshop. And as we were preparing for these sort of sharings towards the end of the workshop, they unmasked. So they were singing and dancing in math. And that is brutal, you know? I mean, I was incredibly impressed by the work they were able to get done, frankly, um, when so much of your communication as an actor is about looking into the face of the person opposite you and wanting to read expression, not to mention hear the articulation of a line of dialogue or the notes of the song. Um, So that was really hard and we did it. And it was really great to see that the work could progress and that there was a moment with those protocols of vaccination and masking and testing all together in place where we could invite solely the performers to unmask everybody around them, director, designers, choreographers, Mm -hmm. everybody else is masked. Um, And that's what we've been doing, you know, in winter time, it was, it was a very similar thing. Everybody in the room vaccinated, tested, um, and mask, except for the moment that you're standing sort of on stage doing your scene work. As soon as you move to the side of the room, Mm. you're done with, you know, your 10 minutes in the center of the room, you're masked again. And I imagine that's what we're going to be doing for Swept Away, which begins rehearsals here on Tuesday. Yeah, I'd say ours is very similar. And and we're, uh, our first, uh, well, we did workshops and did some things where we had masked folks throughout the, that process. But then by the time we got into production for Lizard Boy, that part of my selection of that piece six months ago in anticipation of where we ended up was that uh, this was a bubble already. This this group was a, a threesome that had been working together and mm. known each other for years. And so they came as that bubble. So they were able to be unmasked, um, though they were tested twice a week and we had the the everyone else in the room was masked. Anyone else who ever came into the room to see anything or do anything, bring props in or whatever, had to be tested. And we're still in that protocol. So everyone else is is masked, but the performers are masked up until the moment they're actually doing scene work and then mm-hmm. they go right back into the mask and simply. So what's tough uh, watching the directors and, and, and through this, cause I haven't, I haven't directed in that mode yet though. I'm going to Seattle in two weeks and directing a workshop and we'll be in this mode is you, you're getting notes from your director and in all you're seeing is their eyes and trying to hear their tone. Are they smiling? Are they grimacing? You know, is the actor getting the note and, and taking it and, and what's their response? Mm-hmm. It's, it's really tricky because we are such social beasts as humans and as in theater, we really read body language and, and expression, facial expression. Yeah. So it, it's challenging. Um, and so sometimes, you know, because I've tested, you know, I test a couple times a week, you know, I'll come in with my mask on, I'll do whatever. And then before I leave, I'll drop my mask just long enough for them to see I'm smiling and I love you guys. And you, and you can just feel this instant, like everyone's shoulders like drop and, and their smile back and they're like, okay, we're all good. But until then, everyone's just like, you're on point because you're trying to listen and you don't know, am I hearing the tone right? What's happening? It's it's not that much fun, but you know it it, it it works out, you know, and everyone is working very hard to make it happen. You know that actually brings to mind um, one of the researchers that we've worked with, and you all I think I know know of this has a feeling that 
The masks will affect the way the audience responds to other audience members. There's a way that we read off of each other, but there's definitely a way that the, the actors read off the audience while they're playing. And so I hadn't thought about, have, have they mentioned anything? Have you noticed that the actors are responding differently or maybe not getting the visual and verbal cues that they normally would from an audience to sort of read how they're, they're following what's happening on stage? I'm just curious, maybe, maybe yeah, not. Yeah, a bit, a bit. And I'll just say real quick, and then Joanne, you should jump into it, is, is one of the things I've said actually for 30 years uh, doing this, but I kind of pumped it up right now, is I, the last thing I say is make some noise to the audience. Mm. Mm -hmm. like, make some noise. Like, we need to hear from you. Like, just make some noise. And so, um, you know, I, hopefully that helps. But I do feel like the actors, they, they do, they can read vibe so they're mm -hmm. getting vibe but they but expression is part of it even if they're not looking at the audience you can kind mm -hmm. of feel that mm -hmm. energy and you can tell if somebody when people laugh or when they gasp or when they have whatever vocal response they have hearing it through a mask is dulling that um but yeah. but so they're getting the bigger responses but there's probably a number of subtler ones mm -hmm. that not be getting back as much Mm -hmm. What do you think, Joanne? Is that true for your folks? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's an interesting question. I hadn't posed it to them now that they've been in front of audiences for a couple mm -hmm. of weeks. I'm really curious to know more as they've acclimated to that. I don't know. I find that when I've been an audience member and I've now done it a bunch, you know, partly because I feel a responsibility to turn up for my friends and my colleagues. And also it's all research, right? Every theater you walk into, you're learning something about how to make this work. Um, I find that I'm more inclined to be vocal at a time that perhaps mm -hmm. I would smile or chuckle and you feel like you want to sort of push your responses out through your mask because you know how hard it is to be, um, to feel like any of the responses that you get are, are essentially muted. In that way that we're all grinning at each other so hard that you know our eyes are all clenched <laughs> up now because we have to tell the people who we're encountering, I'm actually smiling at you. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to hear also, I'm going to say something, but I want to hear Sean's response because you and your collective, I think, have a different way in viewing audiences and how they might interact with you during mm. the show. But like the idea of etiquette comes up a lot, theater etiquette. And it's something interesting, too, that I'm I'm grateful that this is now the response that we are having, where we are dismissing a lot of the politeness and manners that used to be associated with seeing theater and now we're actually asking for our audiences to be as vocal um, and as participatory as possible so that the artists that are on stage in front of them feel that energy and it helps fuel them as they continue to do the work um, and so i actually am a little happy about this and again as someone who works with young audiences and has been working with young audiences for almost 20 years like I truly desire that type of response from an audience as opposed to more of the traditional, like we're sitting here politely, the song ends and we clap and then that's it. Uh, it's been kind of interesting that because there's a barrier now physically, audiences mm -hmm. want to be more vocal so that they know that, so that the actors know that they are being um, appreciated in the moment. Yeah. Sean, I am interested to hear what what you might have been experiencing. Well, you know, we, we've had very few uh, live in, indoor events. So I, I've been, like Felser was saying, I've been more as an audience member myself. Um, mm -hmm. No, I think I think gratitude is the first thing that most audience members are, are, are feeling. And so that probably comes out, you know, more vocal, more hype, you know, more responsive than normal. But... Uh, we're still in the waiting game. Yeah. I'm going to ask one more question before we go to the questions from the audience. So that's kind of queuing up our folks who will be sending me questions. Um, but I, I just was curious about so much has happened in the last, you know, 20, 22 months. And for all of us and for the whole world in so many ways, and, and not only the pandemic, but, you know, as as we've been talking about and you brought up first, Sean, the way that 
the, the racial reckoning that we're having. So much has happened. And I just wonder what, what has maybe been the biggest learning that you've had either personally or for your, for the theater or the world? Like what, how are you different now than you were in February of 2020? I would say, you know, to what I was saying earlier too, I, I just feel, uh, you know, as a citizen of this country, I feel so much clearer uh, about the direction I want to head in and who I want to be with and who I want to be around and what kind of madness I won't be around. Um, so, you know, it's it's a strange time because it's so beautiful and it's also completely horrifying. So uh, I think that that, for what we do, it, you have to buckle down and you have to be really clear, more clear than ever and more passionate and more committed than ever to, to doing what you want to do. And I'm, you know, I believe in bringing people together um, and I believe in uplift and I believe in love you know, and I believe in representation. And so all this other madness that's happening on political levels, on nonsense, madness, fake news levels, it's just, you know, it's, it's so much devilish static. So it makes it harder to exist as a human being and as a soul, but in a weird way, not to sound too righteous about it, it makes it clearer what, what we're doing. Because all of us that do live performance or creative arts like this we, we choose to do this there's you gotta do it you know you gotta do it if we had other means to exist we would but we're committed to this so you have to you f have to recommit in a way i mean the battle is on it's, it's bizarrely and I, i'm not trying to be putting too much on it but it's you know the the space between revolutionary and storytelling just got a little closer together because of all of this madness. And, and I'm okay with that part of it. I, I don't like all the hate, but I'm okay with us, you know, fighting for a cause, especially here in the Bay area where that's what we believe in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tim. I love listening to you talk, Sean. Man, we need to hang out some more, man. We've got to find a way, brother. I know, I know, we'll do it. Um, I, 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 the only thing I'll say, I, I'm not so sure that I could say that I'm learning uh, new things as much as really beginning to deeper, having a deeper understanding of mm -hmm. just how, um, how the structures that we have been operating under uh, many of our theaters um, how how uh, white supremacy models and policies and ways of thinking have infiltrated so deeply into the base structures of our organizations um, through any number of different uh, parts of our organization, um, not just what's happening in our on stage and, and who we select and who is in our mm -hmm. audience, but in our funding models, in our um, in the ways that we go about hiring and the, and and when there's lack of community or relationship to everyone in our community, how that has been reinforced by other models that we've just taken for granted in the American theater. So we've been working against a very strong structure that has been keeping our theaters from being as accessible as Kalia was talking about, as yeah. diverse, as inclusive and as equitable as they need to be. And looking through an anti-racist lens, um, through all of our structures, not just what we put on our stage, is is this shift that I feel is we've been talking about in the American theater, many of us for a very long time is now no longer really a question. The question is how the question is, 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 is how to get everyone on board and how to decenter um, the 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 white power structures that have held things in place and people who are very good people who have not may, maybe you know at all been consciously aware of 
the impact of those structures are now mm-hmm. having to do that. And we've been talking about it and talking and talking. I think it's getting clearer now. So I can only say for me, I am incredibly hopeful that mm-hmm. we are finally as a, a nation and as a, a theater industry beginning to take on these issues in uh, not just alone as one company or alone as an artist coming into an institution, but that now if you speak, I'm hoping as you come in as an artist and I'll speak specifically as a BIPOC artist going into an institution, many of whom are predominantly and historically white uh, and have been all these years, I can say something about something and it will no longer be like, I don't know what you're talking about or, mm. or, or people being so offended that you brought it up or not saying anything and just not hiring you again. All this, it feels like we're in a moment now where there is a groundswell of understanding that is beginning to happen. We've got to get it to our boards and we have to get our audiences, uh, uh, the traditional audiences that many of our theaters have to begin to understand it because they're holding on to some things that, and continue to do damage, but I'm hopeful. I feel very hopeful that that something significant is going to come out of all of this work um, that's happening right now. So that's where I am. I'm, yeah. I'm, on, the hope, I'm on the hope Joanna. train. Yeah, Joanna. Yeah, I mean, part of what I'm feeling is just this incredible sense of responsibility. I feel really responsible to creating an atmosphere in which the artists who I invite into this organization can work in safety, with a sense of respect, with a sense of care. Um, I feel really responsible to my staff. This has been an incredibly challenging time for anybody trying to make a living in the arts. And, you know, there are people who've frankly chosen to leave the field. And I think we have to collectively figure out how to make this, you know, Sean and Tim, you're both pointing to this sense of commitment that people who make theater, who make live entertainment feel. And and how are we, from the point of view of institutions, going to meet that commitment to them? How are we going to make this seem like a viable career path and life path? Mm. And I also feel extraordinary responsibility to my audience to make this a place of invitation, a place of welcome, a place of joy. Um, I'm also really aware that people have relationships to each one of our organizations where they come to us as a place of learning. You know, these are audience members, artists and staff alike who come to us because we create spaces in which they can be transformed as well. How do we make that both a rigorous process and a joyful process? Those are some of the things I'm thinking Mm. about. Mm. Beautiful. Kalia? Well, goodness, getting the opportunity to go last means I can just ditto everything that has been said, and it's been said so beautifully. So thank you, fellow friends, for having the eloquence to speak on it. Um, So everything, yes, anding. And I will just add, because it's my brand, kids, uh, (laughs) that I spoke... um, Uh, now almost a year ago uh, for a webinar and something that I made sure to hammer in is the fact that we as arts educators, working with young audiences, working with young people, we're constantly trying to help them see that they're uh, their imaginations are limitless. Like they can believe and dream anything that they want to. Um, it, anything is possible. And I just have always felt like, why are we creating these spaces that want children to come in and think that way? But we, as the people behind those doors, aren't also thinking that way as well. And so I'm really excited for the type of innovation that is happening, especially in the Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. I mean, we are literally the hub of innovation. And so why can't the arts be like that too? Why can't we be redefining what it means to be theater artists and creating theater here? Um, and, And because we are also 
a community of activists, the history of the Bay Area. I specifically live in West Oakland and right down the street is a beautiful mural in dedication to the Black Panther Party. So I'm constantly reminded of the activism that is that lives and breathes within the Bay Area and the parents who choose to raise their children here with that education. Why wouldn't we program uh, opportunities for them to continue to keep learning and to keep expressing that as well. So I'm actually really excited about what all of this reflective time, forced reflective time has meant for our industry. And is, are you pulling the timer on us? No. All right. There are, there are two questions in the chat. Um, one of them we touched on a little bit, but maybe just let me throw it out there again. There was a question about have, have you found new audiences during these last 20 months? And, and maybe I'll add on to it a bit. And do you think they're going to hang around or are, are they, you know, are they because you, they met you during they met you on screen? Are, are they are they coming into the house? So have you have you found new audiences? We have found some new audience and. Um, and I, I really hope they stay with us. It's hard to know, you know, you never know about that. Yeah. And you don't know if they came just because of the, the uh, form that the theater, that the, the show came to them in, or um, that it was the price was right. Or uh, so we're, you know, as we were, folks were saying earlier, like, we're not going to stop doing some of the things we've learned to do during this mm -hmm. time. And so we're, you know, hopefully that will continue to give tendrils out to folks and, and make connections. You know, it's all about interconnection and, and, and welcome. So we hope that that will be the case. Um, yeah. yeah. There was just one that is a bit of a follow-up, but I think you, you all are doing this. There's a question about if folks are afraid to come into the space, are you, reaching them. And I think uh, almost everyone has talked about streaming and, and, and be continuing to reach audiences digitally. I know, I remember John and Tim specifically, you did Kalia, you are too, I believe. And Sean, are, are you doing digital along with live performance or is that in the plans for the spring? Yeah, I, I think, I think we're going to try to be a little more, what's the word intentional about some of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're not equipped to, you know, Tim got to lend me some of them cameras and Joanna's going to give me some uh, <laughs> microphones for us to do yeah. all streaming. But I think we want to be a little more intentional, just meaning in terms of the aesthetic and the form. So things that are truly maybe more open to being translatable or to living as streaming experiences as well as live experiences. That's the next next that's going to happen, the hybrid form that will come out of this. Okay, and then last question, if you have a moment, which is someone asked about the funders, and I think I, that I will include, you know, your own donors with that. So how has how has philanthropy responded to this moment, both with the pandemic, but also with the racial justice reckoning? Yeah, Sean. I mean, I would say f funders, especially locally, been um, amazingly supportive. That they jumped out of the gate and just came off top and were just like, this is insanity. Can we help you through it? And mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't know a group that has not been supported and not salvaged in some way because of that support. And that's, you know, that's major props there. And then anyone that, that gave it all, those, you're talking about a, a barren spaces being kept alive by boards, donors, individuals, friends. And then, uh, you know, I can't say enough about, and I'm not just kissing butt to get more money, but the, the local funders in particular, I mean, it wasn't even like we had to go, Hey, we're, we're in great need. All of a sudden there were opportunities and it really, it a kept groups alive. It also for like well, our, our little group combo Santo, it helped us, create little pieces to help us stay connected with community that way. So it's been major. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. your hand? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you ask what the relationship to philanthropy has been. It was the only thing that sustained all of us. That was it. There was not a ticket to be sold. I mean, and you know, blessings to all of us who were trying to sell tickets to streaming things, but that was not what was keeping our our lights on or our, you know, health insurance paid for. It was absolutely our boards, our donors. And I'll just add, it was the federal government. And I will just say for the first time in my adult producing life, the federal government supported the arts in this country in a way that I have never experienced before. Mm -hmm. And it made all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, 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 I third that, those emotions. Absolutely. And, and our, you know, boards and, and audience members and, you know, who donated tickets back when they couldn't come to see shows, people really stepped up to help us. So we're very thankful for it. I, I'm concerned how much longer that will continue mm. um, as, as we all get fatigued with COVID, but uh, just, you know, we still need the support and because we're not going to be back up to full capacity again um, for a while. And so without philanthropy, um, most of our arts organizations would be closed, shuttered permanently right now uh, after this amount of time. Gina. And Tim, I think it's so important we, what you just said. We are not back to full capacity. Um, you know, the emergence from this time is going to be its own journey. And I think um, we do need the support. We do need audiences to be willing to take that step back into all of our theaters. And I know it's a little frightening the first time, and I would just really assure people um, paddle, paddle, paddle. The water's fine. We're going to look after you. And we need you to partner with us on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I yeah. fourth yeah, all of that. I fourth yeah. all of it. Um, the last thing that I will say is that just in real time, we were able to witness um, the hearts of our community where we reached out and said, we're going to throw this holiday event. And all of the proceeds are going to our fundraising efforts for our education outreach program, which provides free access programming to all students throughout the entire Bay Area so that we can continue our mission of every single child in the Bay Area will have some touch point of arts. And it sold out in a day and a half. We had to add an extra little gathering on Sunday just because people were really invested in one coming back and supporting us, but also the mission behind it. And I just am really grateful that individuals here in the Bay Area truly do have that philanthropy heart. Thank you. I, we're on 65 minutes, which I think is our end time. So I want to thank each of you, Kalia and Sean and Joanna and Tim for your time. It's been such a great conversation. And I'm going to hand it back to Ann Smith. Yes. <laughs> As the, I'm the audience person. <laughs> and we're having very similar issues, even at, at the Commonwealth Club and getting getting people back in after they've been streamed. But Many people have found out that never heard of us or you before. So it's it's a, a bit of a, a sun, ray of sunshine. Thanks so much, Brad Erickson, Sean San Jose, Kalia Davis, Tim Bond, and Joanna Felser for joining us at this wonderful meeting about refilling seats in association with Theater Bay Area. With wonderful leaders like this, we, the audience, have to participate and open the door and have a seat. So let's do it. <laughs> I'm Ann W. Smith, president of Theater Bay Area and co-chair for the Commonwealth Club member-led arts forum. We look forward to you joining us again during this, the Commonwealth Club's 118th year of enlightened public discussion. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much.